Okay, next we'll be looking at the levels of organization of protein. There are four different levels of organization and uh, we can also call this as uh, four different structures of uh, protein, right? So you see, you hear me using these two terms, levels of organization and structure quite interchangeably. Okay, so don't get confused. So first, let's look at the primary structure, which refers to the type number and sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide. And of course, they are joined by peptide bonds. Okay, so the significance of the primary structure is that the sequence right, would determine how the polypeptide is going to be folded in the other levels of organization. The folding of the polypeptide would determine the final 3D shape of the protein. And the shape would in turn determine the function. Okay, so before I move on, just uh, clarify some terms. Polypeptide right, would refer to the chain of amino acids that's not yet folded. Once it is folded, right, then usually we will call this a protein. Okay, so these two terms are not that interchangeable. Okay, so uh, do be careful lah, as to when to use uh, these two terms. Okay, so when I say polypeptide, I'm referring to the chain, the sequence of amino acids. When I say protein, then you know that it has already been folded into its uh, final 3D shape. Can. Okay, so let's move on. Because uh, each protein, right, have its own uh, particular amino acid sequence, right, so each protein has a particular primary structure. When we change the amino acid sequence, right, maybe because of mutation, for example, then the shape of the protein might be changed and the function of the protein also might be lost. And then this protein would no longer be a normal functioning protein. Okay, so all proteins, all normal proteins at least, would have a particular, a specific primary structure. Okay, next up, the secondary structure. This refers to the localized folding and coiling within a particular polypeptide chain. Localized because we are looking at how just a segment of the polypeptide chain is uh, folded or coiled. Okay, not the entire polypeptide chain, not just a segment. So it's, uh, the word to describe this is localized. The folding or coiling would involve the formation of hydrogen bonds uh, at regular intervals. Okay, inter intra chain because uh, there's only one polypeptide chain, right? So the so the hydrogen bonds is within this chain or intra chain. Okay, so the hydrogen bonds, right, are formed between the CO group and the NH group of the amino acid. Right? So the CO group comes from the carboxyl group, right, and the NH would come from the amino group. Lah. And because the carboxyl group and amino group are involved in peptide bond formation, right, so we can also describe the hydrogen bonds as being formed between peptide bonds. So like I mentioned before, when we look at peptide bonds, the entire CO and NH is considered or labeled as a peptide bond, right? So when a hydrogen bond is formed between this CO and this NH, it is really a hydrogen bond formed between two peptide bonds. So there are two ways for you to describe, right, the formation of the hydrogen bonds, yeah? Either you name the CO and NH, or you can simply say there are hydrogen bonds formed between peptide bonds. Okay, so it's CO and H, so therefore uh, no R groups are involved. Okay, so there are two types of secondary structure. We look at the first type, which is the alpha helix. Okay, so in alpha helix, the hydrogen bonds are formed really regularly. Yeah? They are formed between the nth amino acid with the nth plus four amino acid in the polypeptide chain. So the, for example, if it is the 10th amino acid in the chain, then it will form a hydrogen bond with the 14th amino acid in the polypeptide chain if this segment is coiled into an alpha helix. The coiling uh, happens in this direction, right? It is uh, round around the long axis right, of the alpha helix. So when the alpha helix goes like this, right, then the coiling also go in the same direction. The R groups are all projected outward. Okay, and the hydrogen bonds that are formed 
are parallel to the axis of the uh, alpha helix. Each turn of the alpha helix, right, consists of around 3.6 amino acids. So this is uh, quite regular, right? So the alpha helix is not some, is not some random coil, yeah? It is uh, quite a standard way for the segments of the polypeptide to coil. Okay, so all alpha helix would have the same measurements, the same uh, properties, right? 3.6 amino acids per turn, hydrogen bonds formed between N and N plus 4 amino acid. Right, so this one, hydrogen bonds, right, between the CO and NH, we have mentioned this already. Okay, next would be the second common type of uh, secondary structure, the beta pleated sheet. So when the beta pleated sheet is formed, right, it consists of um, two or more uh, beta strands, right? So the polypeptide, the segment of the polypeptide is folded in such a way that they have uh, these parallel segments. Each one is a beta strand and together it is one beta sheet or beta pleated sheet. Okay, and again, they are uh, maintained or stabilized by hydrogen bonds that are formed between peptide bonds. Okay, so each one is called a beta strand. So this one is uh, one beta strand uh, circled here. Together, this, this three would form a beta pleated sheet. So stabilized by hydrogen bonds mentioned already. Again, another diagram just showing you the formation of the hydrogen bonds between amino acids found on the adjacent beta strands. Uh, focus on the word intra chain, right? So again, we are looking at secondary structure, right? So it's formed within one polypeptide chain. Eh? So when we say uh, hydrogen bonds between adjacent beta strands, these are not adjacent polypeptides, right? It's the same polypeptide just adjacent segments of the same polypeptide that forms adjacent beta strands. I guess this is a common misconception that your seniors had. So I, uh, let me here just uh, warn you right, to not be confused. Right, so for the beta pleated sheet, right, similarly to the uh, alpha helix, the R groups are all projected outward. For a sheet, outward means above and below. <laughs> okay, so these are the R groups, yeah? Okay, there are two types of uh, beta beta sheet depending on the orientation or the direction of the beta strands. You have the anti-parallel one in which uh, the beta strands are of different directions and then you have the parallel ones in which the beta strands are in the same direction. Okay, so it's two types of uh, beta beta sheet. Can. Okay, so there's a question in your notes, right? Asking you what determines the formation of alpha helix and beta pleated sheet. But the answer is uh, the primary structure because the primary structure determines the folding of the polypeptide. So it determines which part of the polypeptide is folded into an alpha helix, which part is folded into a beta pleated sheet. Okay, move on to the tertiary structure. This uh, refers to the extensive folding of uh, the polypeptide, not a portion, as I may change here, right? A typo here in uh, my slide. Extensive folding of the polypeptide. Okay, just now, uh, we mentioned in the secondary structure is localized folding, right? Because it's just a segment or a portion of the polypeptide. Now we are talking about the entire polypeptide folding. So that's why the word to describe this is extensive. Right? So you can see the difference right, in the type of folding between the secondary and tertiary structure. The bonding involved are also different. Right? It's no longer just hydrogen bonds. Here we have uh, four different types of uh, bonds or interactions. The hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, disulfide bonds, as well as the hydrophobic interactions. And these are formed between our groups of amino acids that are far away. So just now for the secondary structure, right, the hydrogen bonds are formed between amino acids that are near because it's a, it's a localized coiling, right, or localized folding. Now we are talking about extensive folding, which means uh, amino acids that are at 
two different ends of the polypeptide may interact. So that's why we say that the bondings are formed between amino acids far away. And the bondings involve the R groups, right? no longer the peptide bonds, it involves the R groups. Okay, so when a protein has a tertiary structure, it is extensively folded, then the final shape would be a compact uh, globular shape. Okay, so imagine a polypeptide chain that is a linear, right? It's a uh, crumbled, in a sense, crumbled together, right? Extensively folded, then you will get a roughly spherical or we call globular shape that is very compact, right? very uh, tightly coiled, tightly folded together. Okay, so because it's an extensive folding, right, amino acids that are far away in the polypeptide chain can be brought close together and they can form localized regions of the protein, like for example, the active site, if it's the enzyme, for example. And also, right, the result of such uh, extensive folding usually is that the Amino acids with uh, hydrophilic R groups would usually be folded in such a way that they are found closer to the surface of the protein, while the amino acids with the hydrophobic R groups are folded in such a way that they are found more in the interior, shielded away from the water. Right, so this makes sense because the R groups that are hydrophilic would be able to interact with water, so you want them to be found on the surface. And the hydrophobic R groups, right, cannot interact with water, so you want to shield the hydrophobic R groups away from water in the interior of the protein. So when the globular protein, the tertiary protein, is folded in such a way, it is able to interact with water overall. So therefore, it is able to dissolve in water. It becomes water soluble. Right. So when you see a protein that is globular in shape, you can straight away deduce that it should be soluble in water. Right, and uh, we look at the secondary structure already, right? So a protein that has a tertiary structure may also have secondary structure in its uh, overall folding. Okay, so this is a tertiary protein, a globular protein, extensively folded, but certain parts of the polypeptide you can see forms secondary structure. Okay, and lastly, the quaternary structure, it refers to the association of two or more polypeptide chains. So when you have multiple polypeptide chains coming together to form one protein, then this protein is described as having a quaternary structure or it is a quaternary protein. The uh, multiple polypeptide chains come together also by forming uh, bonds. The same bonds found in the tertiary structure also formed between uh, our groups. But the amino acids that are forming these bonds, of course, are found on adjacent polypeptides, not in the same polypeptide chain, right? So that's the quaternary structure, okay?